The present is not possible without the past, and so my ability to produce this video depends on the story I'm about to relate. The discovery of gold in Australia prompted a surge of immigration and, in June 1853, the bark Meridian set sail from Gravesend on the Thames. About half the size of a manly ferry, on board were 84 passengers including 17 women and 41 children. A moderately small crew of 23, plus animals, mail and cargo. A year before, the ship had set a record on its maiden voyage to Moreton Bay and Captain Richard Herneman was highly regarded so the journey was expected to be relatively fast. Sailing was good so far as the Cape of Good Hope, but approaching the Roaring Forties, they encountered a series of squalls. The captain decided to make for St Paul's Island, a dot in the southern Indian Ocean about halfway between Africa and Australia. Another strong gale prompted a turn towards Amsterdam Island, a 10 km long volcanic island 80 km further north. The storms increased and soon after nightfall on the 24th of August, the Meridian ran firmly aground on rocks on the southwest of Amsterdam Island. The seas were relentless and the ship began to break up. Their only way off was by crawling along the main mast which had, by luck, fallen towards the island. Soon after all reached shore, the ship broke up completely. At dawn, all but three people were on shore something that seemed miraculous with the number of children involved. Sadly, the captain and two crew perished. However, this was only the first of their challenges. Cliffs on this side of the uninhabited island towered up to 500 metres in places, with snow on higher ground. But above them were just over 100 metres. They still faced the risk of being washed off the rocks, and many had bleeding feet from scrabbling on the sharp volcanic rocks. A barrel of fresh water, tins of herrings, bread and some clothing were salvaged from the wreckage. It took another two days to find a path for all to the top of the cliff. There the wind thwarted attempts to rig a shelter using one of the sails. By this stage they had nothing to eat but grass and, although they had managed to find a little fresh water, the gravity of the situation was apparent. Luckily, smoke from fires lit in the tall grass in an attempt to flush out game had attracted the attention of Captain Isaac Ludlow aboard the Monmouth, an American whaler operating nearby. He knew the island and was able to signal that they should travel to the other side where the terrain was flatter. The crewmen put ashore there met survivors part way across the rugged terrain and guided them to the only safe landing spot on the island. However, by the time they reached there, the Monmouth had been blown out to sea. While waiting its return, they found some wild cabbages and although eaten raw, were a welcome change from grass. But there was no water on this side of the island. Fortunately, seas calmed the next morning and the Monmouth returned. The captain and some crew rowed boats ashore and took all aboard the Monmouth, 13 days after their ordeal began. As they ate heartily, the whaler set sail for Mauritius, arriving 17 days later. However, all the time involved with the rescue had proved costly to the whaling income of all the Monmouth crew. Although looked after well in Mauritius, it would be another two months before most passengers were able to continue their journey aboard the Emma Colvin, a ship that ten years later would be wrecked near Numea. They reached Melbourne two days before Christmas. Captain Ludlow and his crew were later awarded medals and through various collections some recompense. Amongst the survivors was Alfred Luttwich, who later became Queensland's first Supreme Court Justice and lent his name to a suburb. 
But more importantly to me, a 13-year-old girl survived to later become my great-great-grandmother.